Amen, and happy Sabbath to all of you. I hope you can hear me well, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. That's good. Uh, to our uh, to our Zoom host, you can you can uh, actually make me a co-host so I can share my screen eventually in a little while. But uh, I'm I'm just happy uh, to see all of you. And those that I don't see, those that we don't see, I'm also happy because I know this Sabbath day, they are uh, uh, with us in spirit and truth. Uh, we all love the Lord. We are all faithfully waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. And on this uh, blessed day of the Lord, uh, we are all in tune with God. And uh, we just, we just want to uh, recognize him and offer him our best uh, praises an adoration and worship today for he alone, he alone deserve it. Uh, mind you, brothers and sisters, up to now, I, I still have the hangover of our beautiful Sabbath experience last weekend. What about you? <laughs> uh, I want to thank each one of you. I want you to know it. And please relay the same thing to those who are not here with us today for some good reasons. They may be somewhere, but please tell them the same thing. I want you all to know that those precious souls that the Holy Spirit of God ushered into God's kingdom officially and formally last Sabbath day uh, came out as a result of the concerted ministry of Madoff Church family. That means to say each one of you have contributed to uh, the decision that those precious souls have made for Jesus Christ. Amen? Young and old alike, each one of you have contributed. That's how it should be. That's how we're going to finish the Lord's work in these last days. Our elders were amazing uh, last Sabbath day. I commend them and I praise them for their ministry. Our female and male deacons are commendable. Everyone, brothers and sisters, our children, those who led in the singing, and everyone. And up to this moment, this beautiful Sabbath day, I'm just blessed from the Sabbath school time, the, uh, the remarks of our dear sister, the lesson review, Bible lesson review, the participation and comments of each one. They're all, they're all because you understand that we are a priesthood of all believers. And we are fellow ministers together with Jesus Christ in these last days. So I say, let us all continue to be faithful priests and ministers of the Lord. And together as one, with the unity that Jesus Christ wanted his church to experience, let us endeavor to give our best and contribute to the finishing of, of God's work. Now, let me share my screen now uh, at this time. Right away. Okay. What real disciples do is uh, the topic of uh, the discourse that I want to share with each one of you. We had a wonderful discussion in the Sabbath school lesson time, and uh, it was presented clearly to us what God expects from his people when it comes to having a real, pure, and undefiled religion in these last days particularly from the last portion of the week lesson on Matthew 25. It is focused on each one of us using our spiritual gifts and all resources that God has entrusted to us to serve our people around us, to meet the needs of people around us. But just as before we pray, my challenge to myself is this. But you look around these days, you look around these days, 
This need-oriented approach is not only being done by the Adventist Church. It is being done by companies, corporations. It is being done by different organizations. I know you understand what I'm saying. But what would truly set his people, God's people in these last days, differently from the rest? If everyone will simply be doing what? Good works and good deeds, trying to meet the uh, needs of people around. And this is what I really wanted us to touch on for the few moments that we will be uh, sharing God's word together. And I ask each one at this time to bow your heads, close your eyes, as we ask the Lord to bless our study of his word. Father God, at this very moment, we ask you now that you would fill our hearts with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Consecrate this moment of us reflecting on your word today. Uh, send your mighty spirit to be in our hearts and in our needs at this time to guide us and to teach us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What real disciples do? Yeah. There are many one another Bible verses in the scriptures, uh, which I believe at this time, at all, probably all of you have discovered uh, as you continue to study God's word. Uh, one another passages, you try to count them, would uh, lead to probably uh, a number like 59. Some would say 62, right? But what I'm saying is this one another Bible passages abounds in the scripture, right? More than 50, I should say, because the answer coming from different scholars of the Bible are, you know, somewhat preparing, offering us some variation. But 59 is a good number, I would say, and that's a lot of number. And you can see here on the slide some of those uh, passages. All right. But I would say that perhaps the the most important where it all started passage to one another passage in the scripture is this in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. Not only it is a famous passage in the scripture, but it, it will actually put an answer, a good answer to what I have shared a while ago, the challenge that I have seen. Everyone seems to be abounding in good works these days. Every organization, corporation, and all churches around, even groups, know what it takes these days to win individuals to their side. They know what it means to lead these people to join their ranks. And they understand that the key is to abound in good works, meeting the needs of people around. But I propose from our humble study right now that these two verses here will, by God's grace, tell us in what way can we really be differentiated? In what way can we really be put in a, in, in a real category that God wants us to be, and not only abounding in good works, but what? What does the Lord expect from all his disciples? He expected this from his disciples a long time ago, and this is the same expectation that he had for his disciples in these last days. It says in verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Somebody asked me, why would you entitle this sermon, 
what real disciples do. Instead of say, what real disciples are like. And I know, I know you probably, some of you probably are also thinking along that way. As we go on with the rest of the presentation, I hope that question will, will be answered. So what real disciples do, all right? I put the word do there because if you examine these two verses, it is in the imperative mode. Uh, Jesus is actually promoting some kind, some kind of uh, an action here. His message is dynamic, and he wants his disciples to understand that what he is trying to tell them entails not only theory, but entails action on their part. And for that reason, I say the question is, what will disciples do? That's how I entitled the presentation. Well, let me share three answers to that question that I have raised. Real disciples, real disciples of Jesus Christ, keep the new commandment of Jesus. We are not trying to say, of course, we understand that there is really a new commandment. Verses 34 and 35 is telling us the same uh, love commandment that Jesus Christ uh, shared with his disciples in other portions of the scriptures. It is taken from the Old Testament time in Leviticus 19.18 to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So what is really new with this commandment of Jesus? But what do re the real disciples of Jesus Christ do? They keep the new commandment of Jesus. This is a new commandment. If you will examine the two verses, brothers and sisters, uh, because uh, Jesus is directing these two verses, what? To disciples, to believers, not unbelievers. Uh, there are many uh, Bible passages uh, pertaining to God, how God wanted us as his followers and disciples and believers to deal and treat uh, unbelievers. But this is not the passage. Verses 34 to 35 is directed to the disciples, not unbelievers. Uh, Jesus is telling his disciples, uh, this is what I am ordering you to do. To do to your fellow disciples. This is, has nothing to do with unbelievers, really, if you check the context. So in that sense, it is really new. It is also new because if you observe, uh, this passage is given to the church, to the New Testament church, not to Israel per se, as it was in the Old Testament. It may be the same love, but it is directed to the disciples, not unbelievers, and it is given to the church, not Israel in this case. And last but not the least, this is what makes it so unique. I check on the word new here in the original Greek Bible, and it's not a Greek word which means really new. It means something fresh. This is fresh for the disciples of Jesus because it is geared towards them and what God expects them to do with fellow believers. Uh, this is fresh for the disciples because it is addressed and given to the church, not necessarily the literal Israel. And then it is based on the new standard. This is what is so amazing about the newness of this commandment. As you can see in the portion there, God is telling his disciples to love one another, not the way they love themselves, just like in the Old Testament, but to love one another as he had loved them. That sets the parameter and the standard higher, I believe, right? Uh, we understand, we come across those Bible passages in the Old Testament and even in the New, right? That God wants us to love, what? Greatest commandment, love God and love your fellow man or your neighbor as you love yourself. But this one is fresh 
This is different because it is based on the new standard. It is based on how God loves us. And in the same way, he is telling his disciples, I command you, love one another, not as you love yourself this time, but as I have loved you. Real disciples of Jesus keep the new commandment that he had given him. I remember, by God's grace, can you imagine, brothers and sisters, if we are able to really apply these two verses, this teaching of the Lord? I wonder if Mahatma Gandhi can still say the same words that he uttered that had become famous. You know these words from Mahatma Gandhi? Uh, he said, oh, he wrote, I like Jesus Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I wonder if Mahatma Gandhi had seen these two verses come to life during his encounter with our fellow Christians long time ago. I wonder if he would still write that quotation. Probably not. And so this is a powerful teaching of Jesus Christ then and today in our time. What do real disciples of Jesus Christ do? Real disciples of Jesus Christ, of course, love their fellow disciples, not the way they love themselves, but based on the new standard, as Jesus loved. Now, this, is, this really made me think so hard. This is a common and, and famous and well-known set of verses. But to talk about loving my fellow disciples as Jesus loved is a fascinating one. And at the same time, it is challenging, I would say. And we can probably spend a lot of time talking about the love of Jesus, what kind of love is that? But let me just share three, right? Uh, I don't know if you will agree with me, but the love of Jesus is, is more, than, more than a feel love. You know, I feel that I love you. No, no, it goes beyond that. If you check in the scriptures, it's not just a love that is good in words. I love you. No, 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 no. It's more on, it's more on a love of action. Aren't you glad we have a God who's not just good in saying, I love you? But he is a God of action. When he says, I love you, he would really show it up. And, and so when Jesus Christ died for us when we were still ungodly, when Jesus Christ offered his life when we were still sinners and enemies of the cross, that is the love, the type of love that Jesus had. And he is saying to his disciples then, I want you to love each other the way I offered you this kind of love. It's a love of action. Not just in words, not just by feeling. It's a love of action. You check on the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, this love is, is a love that doesn't play favoritism. It's a love of inclusion. Would you agree, brothers and sisters? It's a love of inclusion. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, for example, God wants everyone to be saved, that everyone will come to repentance. He is a long-suffering God. Uh, God. God loves everyone. And, and this is a challenge sometimes, even with, even with us, uh, believers and disciples of the Lord. Uh, I visited one church one time. I was, uh, I was actually the guest speaker. Uh, nobody greeted me on the door. Uh, nobody welcomed me and uh, ushered me to one of the bench. Uh, nobody knew me. That's fine. I would understand. But what broke my heart that one Sabbath day many years ago uh, was somebody from that church, an Adventist church, uh, gave me a piece of paper. And that sister wrote something that, 
that really made me think so hard. You know what she wrote there in that small piece, piece of paper? She wrote there the words, uh, this church is not an Asian Adventist church. And of course, eventually she found out that I was the invited speaker, but you get what I'm trying to say. Uh, we still have those kinds of challenges even nowadays in the Adventist church. Uh, racism is still around, ethnocentrism still abounds, and all those kinds of things. Uh, Jesus is telling his disciples, I want you to love each other the way I love you. And the love of Jesus is a love of inclusion, black, white, yellow. Uh, if you can come up with any other color of people around the world, violet, do we have those people? <laughs> They're all part of this love of Jesus. And this is what Jesus wants to, to happen in his church. He wants his followers to really love each other with inclusion, not selective. We still have sometimes uh, 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 labelings in our church. We still have sometimes uh, are affected by the way we treat each other by uh, by uh, uh, levels in society, whether uh, this, this, this family is uh, uh, belonging to the rich class and this family is for you still see sometimes the disparity in terms of uh, the way these, these uh, uh, people are treating each other inside the church. But with Jesus, everyone is equal. Everyone is included. Love of inclusion. And then, of course, it was mentioned in our Sabbath school time a while ago, Jesus was so selfless. He's not even thinking of himself. He gave it all. He is the most generous person in the whole universe. He gave his life for everyone. That love, so selfless, so sacrificial. That's the love of Jesus. I'm sure all of you brothers and sisters can add more to the list. But we're just trying to use our time wisely at this time. But I know the love of Jesus, the beautiful, the most beautiful kind of love. It's a love of action. It's a love of inclusion. It's a love of sacrifice, selfless love, divine love, agape love. And that's the love you see here in these two verses. And Jesus, can you imagine? Jesus is telling his disciples then and us now today, I am commanding you to love each other this way. It was in the 1960s when a man by the name of Anton LaBey, you probably know the name, Anton LaBey, he is the founder of the Church of Satan. I'm just thinking. Anton LaBey and his family he passed away already, 1995, I believe. But he claims in his biography and being supported by his family members, that he really didn't mean to start the Church of Satan because he wanted to. No. In his biography, Anton LaBey says he just wanted to protest against Christianity. He simply wanted to show and express his disdain for Christians. Why? Because he claimed to be a victim of the unloving acts, unloving acts of those who profess to be Christians and followers of Christ. And so he said, <laughs> they did me a lot of bad things. These Christians are hypocrites, he said. These Christians say about love and Christ, no, no, but they don't love at all. And so he in his disdain, wanted to protest, he said. Uh, it's a scary way of protesting against Christianity because he started the Church of Satan. He was the author of the Satanic Bible. And you can probably Google and research on what this man did. Now, you know what? Jesus loves him. We all believe that. But I'm just saying again, just like Mahatma Gandhi, 
I don't know if those Christians that Anton LaVey came to encounter in his lifetime, if those Christians have lived out by God's grace the teachings of Jesus in verses 34 and 35 of John 13, I wonder if Anton LaVey would, would establish, would start the church of Satan. Maybe he would still do so, all right? But I'm just driving a point. He was once upon a time a good Christian, according to his biography. But what happened? Oh, because he didn't see John 13, 34, 35 happening. Now, the disciples, fellow believers, they didn't do him good. They took advantage of his kindness. They did him bad, bad things. This is a challenge for you and me, brothers and sisters. What do real disciples of Jesus Christ do? Oh, they keep the new commandment of Jesus. They love fellow disciples as Jesus loved. And third and last but not the least point I want to share. What do real disciples of Jesus do? Real disciples of Jesus are known and will be known by their love for each other. We all know already what kind of love is that. Not the way we love ourselves, but the way Jesus loved each one of us. Now, just think about this portion. Verse 35. Jesus said, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I keep looking at that line, you know, uh, in different ways. I can only come up with three. Three reflections on that. One, I check on the word no in the original Greek Bible. And the word no there means either mark or identity. That's the closest meaning to that word no there. And so Jesus was actually telling his disciples, by this, by this, you will be identified. By this, you will be marked. What? How? You will be identified that you are my genuine disciples. You will be marked as my real disciples if you have love for one another. You try to reflect again on verse 35. You can't help but take on the item number two there, the fruit of saving relationship with God. Uh, you know, those passages abound, you know? Those who hate his brother or sister does not have love. You know those passages. What does it tell you? What does it remind us, right? God is love, right? If you love, right, then you are actually proving not only that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, but that you have experienced this saving grace of God and you have this saving relationship with God that is ongoing and ongrowing. Oh, it's more than the words in verse 35. It reflects if disciples would love each other the way Jesus loved each one of that, them, it would be a reflection of Jesus and his love for them. It will be the greatest evidence of real Christianity. Of course, it will serve as their identifying mark as Christ's true followers. I keep thinking about this. Common verses in the Bible. But it stopped. It contains a very serious and powerful message. And the last reflection I have here is that the world will know the real disciples of Jesus by their Christ-like love. It's not just love. Christ-like love. You check on the researches. The Seventh-day Adventist Church Organization is one of the best and good organization, church organization out there in the world today. You know that? Are we going to be known because of our good structure, our good church governance? Yeah, perhaps. But Jesus is telling us today, no, 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 no. The world will know. 
that you are really my real disciples because of your Christ-like love. As much as you have a good church governance, we have a fascinating set of teachings and doctrines. Amazing. Praise the Lord. Especially the Sabbath truth, righteousness by faith, sanctuary truth. Name it all. Other people perhaps will come to know us because of our beautiful set of teachings, really biblical, Christ-centered teachings. But this morning, Jesus is trying to tell us, yes, I've given you the best teachings. But you know what? As much as they are good teachings, the world will still know my real disciples by their Christ-like love. Uh, you're, you're getting what I'm trying to share, brothers and sisters. And name it. This and that, those things are good. Church organization, teachings, you know, and all those other things that we can put on the list. They're good. Praise the Lord. They, we are blessed with all those beautiful things. And even with the name Seventh-day Adventist Church, oh, I've taught church history, denominational history for many years. And somebody would ask me from time to time, where did we get our name? Pastor Jerry, where did we get our name, sir? Of course, David Hewitt, right, brothers and sisters? Right away, that name will come to, you know, our minds. Elder David Hewitt, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, we believe, when he came up with that name. When he proposed that, everybody agreed. And so we adopted that name, Seventh-day Adventist, and we know what it means, right? That name will send a powerful message to anybody who would come across that name. But as much as that name is beautiful and heaven sent as well, Jesus, I believe, is reminding us, no, but still, the world will still know my real disciples by their Christ-like love. As much as the name Seventh-day Adventist Church is heaven sent, as much as uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church organization is good, as much as the Seventh-day Adventist holds the biblical Christ-centered teachings that many people will be blessed to know. But still Jesus is saying, I believe today, brothers and sisters, yet the world will still know you if you're my real disciples by your Christ-like love this is not an announcement from jesus brothers and sisters this is not an option that's why it says a new commandment jesus said i give to you it's a commandment this is the will of jesus christ for his disciples then this is the will of Jesus Christ for his disciples today. Ellen G. White wrote so many comments on John 13, 34 to 35. But what caught my attention is this part uh, written in Review and Herald, June 30, 1910. A new conception of love. Why was this called? Ellen White wrote a new commandment. I've put it in red. Allow me to do that right away. The disciples had not loved one another as Christ had loved them. Oh, that Ellen White is saying, based on inspiration that she received, that the reason why Jesus taught his disciples these two verses then was because he knew they had not loved one another as Christ had loved them. That was their situation. I hope and pray that that is not our case today. But by the grace of God, this is just a reminder. But we are already on it. We are already loving each other as Christ had loved each one of us, brothers and sisters. They had not yet seen the fullness of the love that he was to reveal in man's behalf. It says uh, they were yet to see him dying on the cross for their sins through his life and that they were to receive a new conception of love. The command to love one another was to gain a new meaning in the light of his self-sacrifice. In the light shining from the cross of Calvary, they were to read the meaning of the words, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. What real disciples of Jesus Christ do? Huh? 
I remember my I remember my mentor. I remember my mentor. His name was Dr. Indrasena Wijinayaki. Uh, this guy is blessed with wisdom from above. He holds five PhDs. But he was he was a Hindu. He belongs to the Brahman caste, you know, the caste system in India. But he had encountered many Seventh-day Adventist folks like you and me when he was growing up as a kid. And he was, he was fascinated by the teachings of the Adventist church. And even when he grew older in the university, he's taking his doctoral studies. God allowed him, I believe, to meet, you know, every now and then Adventist Christians like you and me. But in his testimony, he said, many have attempted, and even many pastors like me, have attempted to share the Adventist faith to him, give him Bible study, offered him all kinds of things, and made an appeal. But for many years, he did not decide to believe and embrace Jesus Christ in the context of the Adventist faith. And so he was telling me his story. And I asked him, why? Why did you not make the decision? He said, yeah, I admire the teachings. It's beautiful. I admire the churches, the organization. And so I bugged him again. You know, why did you not make the decision? Uh, he said, I have to be honest with you because I have seen how Adventist Christians treat each other. And I don't have an answer to that. I was trying to share Jesus and the Adventist faith with him when we met in the class. He was not yet an Adventist that time. And so he shared with me his testimony. Uh, he said, I hope and pray you will be the last Adventist pastor to try to convince me to become an Adventist Christian. But anyway, make the story short. <laughs> From there, I just keep praying for this professor of mine. And then after many weeks, he began contacting me and telling me about his experience. Because he said, he doesn't know where it starts, but every morning say between two to three in the morning he would hear a special music that he doesn't know where it's coming from and what kind of music is that now, later on fast forward i will tell him that that music was actually uh the the the, the song you know for god so loved the world that we all know so well but he's a hindu he doesn't know it but he's hearing it being played i don't he, he said i don't know what kind of instrument uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. But no lyrics, of course. He just hear the tune, and it doesn't stop. Every morning, every morning, 2 to 3 in the morning, he would hear it. And so he said one day, he consulted me, I don't know what music is that, but I want you to pray for me. You're a pastor, right? Because I keep hearing it every day, 2 to 3 in the morning. I told him, I'll pray for you. But uh, I want you to know that if you ask me to pray for you, and here I go again, I will, I will keep sharing Jesus and the Adventist faith to you again, sir. But he said, I, oh, never mind, but just pray for me. Anyway, it went on for many, many months until one day he told me he can't bear it anymore. And he said, could it be that there is a God who's trying to communicate with me? This is a Hindu professor. And I told him, Next time you hear it, sir, why don't you, <laughs> I'm not teaching you to pray. Why don't you just, why don't you just try to follow, try to follow and see where that music is coming from. I remember that's what I told him. And I will pray for you. Oh, he agreed, went home and he heard it again. He heard it again. All right. And he followed my counsel. Hindu professor. He studied all the 28 fundamental beliefs. He knows our teachings. Many pastors have come to teach him. 
with PhDs, but he cannot accept because he said, I have seen how Adventist people treat each other in the church, and I just don't like it. They don't have love. Well, that's his case, but I'm not giving up on him anyway. He followed that music, early morning music. You know where it led? It's not in the apartment. It's not in the neighborhood. He just keep walking. That music led him to a stream, a stream, three in the morning. And in that stream, the music stopped. And then when he was about to turn, he saw a humble Adventist pastor standing there. And the humble Adventist pastor told him, you must be that person who heard the music, the same music that I keep hearing each morning. And the Lord showed me and the Lord told me that I need to be here today at this time because God had called someone who is finally, who is finally about to give his life to Jesus Christ because God's plan for him is huge because God wanted him to become his messenger. Right there and then, this Hindu professor of mine was baptized. He never turned back again. Yeah, he was not convinced to become an Adventist Christian up until God himself did the conversion. But his issue has something to do with John 13, 34, and 35. But nevertheless, God overlooked it because God has a big plan for him. You know who he is right now? He had served our church. He, he had trained so many missionaries. One of those is me to train to go to 1040 window, to take on the hardest uh, task out there, uh, to share Jesus and his love. And he is now working for United States government and the United Nation as their leading researcher. I'm proud of what God had done to this man. Well, he, he doesn't want to become an Adventist like you and me because of John 13, 34 and 35, yet God had big plans for him. But what I'm telling brothers and sisters is this. These two verses is serious, you know. It's a serious reminder for you and me. Just last month, COVID-19 is still going on. I got the chance to lay to rest an old sister in the church here in Ontario. Her name was Hilaria. She's 97 years old. She was rushed to the hospital. She's about to die. One of her daughter was a registered nurse, and so she was allowed to stay there. Others will not be allowed because of COVID-19. I got the chance to call by a phone early in the morning. And I'm telling you, this 97-year-old sister of ours, all right, throughout her life have led so many people in the Adventist faith and into Jesus Christ. How? She doesn't know how to give Bible studies. She is just abounding with so much love for the church, for everyone, for all people. She would use her pension to send uh, students to school, poor members of the church who cannot send their children to school. She would use her pension. She would use her pension to buy groceries to people who are less fortunate than ours. And so a lot of people, because of the kindness crusade of this sister of ours, embrace Jesus and the Adventist faith. But what is so amazing is the last moments of her life. Oh, before she died, I was on the phone. All the doctors were there. All the nurses in that hospital in Toronto were there. Uh, she can't hear anymore. And so she, her voice is so loud. She called on her daughter nurse who was there beside her. Come here. Come here. I don't want you to cry, but I know my time is about to come. I just want you to remember two things. I want you to tell your brothers and sisters, gather them after I passed away, gather them and tell them this is what mommy, what mommy wants everyone to know. Two things. One, uh, I couldn't believe it, Elder Donovan, because the first one she said is this. <sighs> Tell your brothers and sisters to be faithful stewards of God in these last days. Remind them 
of my tithe and offering, it's there under my bed. Tell them not to forget to give it this coming Sabbath. That Sabbath that is coming. She passed away uh, Friday night. And then tell every one of your brothers and sisters to follow my example. Tell them to be faithful stewards of God in these last days. But that is only secondary, she said. My first message to your brothers and sisters is this. Tell them more than anything else to love one another. Tell your brothers and sisters to love one another. I have tried my whole life, she said, to follow John 13, 34, and 35. Now I want you, my children, tell your brothers and sisters to do the same. And I'm going to meet all of you again when Jesus Christ will come. What a testimony. What a testimony. This is the will of the Lord, brothers and sisters, for us as disciples of Jesus in these last days. And I believe this is what the world is waiting. We have a wonderful church organization. Not perfect, but wonderful. We have a beautiful message to share to the world. We abound in good works. We keep the Sabbath. But Jesus is telling us today, I want you to keep the Sabbath but with the love of Jesus in your heart. Because you can do that without the love of Jesus. I want you to keep becoming generous, but I want you to be generous because of the love of Jesus in your heart. And I want you to be good to each other because of the love of Jesus in your heart. Simple message, brothers and sisters, but it's tough. It's challenging. You know why? Because we can never do this by ourselves. We need Jesus Christ all the more in our lives. Because he said, I just don't want you to love each other as you love yourself. I want you to love each other as I have loved you. How in the world Pastor Jerry can do that? I wanted to love each one of you. But I need Jesus because he wants me to love each one of you the way he loved me. And he wants you and all of us in Made of Church to do the same to each other. I pray that the Lord's blessings be upon this beautiful set of verses that God wants us to remember. Happy Sabbath to all of you. And may we all truly be the kind of disciples of Jesus in these last days who would love each other the way Jesus had loved each one of us. Amen. Praise the Lord.